So I'm going to briefly talk to you about three areas where genetics is having an impact on poor prognosis patients. Uh, endometrial receptivity, really for repeat implant implantation failure patients. Um, some data that's just coming out looking at pre-implantation testing for aneuploidy, PGTA, and how that's impacting miscarriage rates. And then just some future-looking data that we're seeing from a new test that we developed and some new data that's come out from some other groups looking at PGT analysis and how that is potentially going to inform us of new data on male infertility patients. So I was rather drawn by Hippocrates' slide earlier, um, the simple premise of one normal egg, one normal sperm, one normal uh, embryo produced and put back in the optimal time in the optimal place. And the genetics is often normal egg, normal sperm, um, but endometrial receptivity is optimal, potentially optimal place, but really optimal timing. And it's looking to get the optimal implantation window for your patients to try and improve, particularly for the recurrent implantation failure. And it's, it's a lovely set of slides that just really defines this area. So if we look at the window of implantation, the menstrual cycle, um, the textbooks will tell us that after ovulation, really uh, five days after ovulation, we have a window of implantation where the endometrium is most receptive to the embryo being placed back. Um, and that is the case for most women. And we uh, have been looking at this for some time uh, at Cooper Genomics and looking to see if we can identify those patients where the window of, of implantation is displaced. So why test for it? So we're testing to find those patients really that have a displaced window of implantation and then guide the implantation at the correct time to get the optimal outcome. So we report three different statuses of the window of implantation. The receptive state, which is your textbook state, five days after progesterone administration. And that is, applies for about 70% of women. So actually, what you do right now is optimal for those women. But for some women, the window of implantation is uh, what we call pre-receptive. So if you're putting the embryo back at day five, it's not yet ready for the embryo. Or it's post-receptive, and actually, if you put back in day five, the optimal stage for receptivity has passed. And we take uh, a mock cycle in order to try and identify, identify um, what the optimal stage is and then use that information from a mock cycle to infer in a treatment cycle to get the right window of implantation. And in this instance we do a mock cycle and the uh, window of implantation is uh, pre-receptive so further along and we would run the genetic test uh, and then we would inform the, uh, inform the patient and the clinician that the implantation has to be delayed by one day to try and improve implantation. Our test uh, for this particular area is called ERPEAK, uh, an endometrial receptivity test. Um, it's a expression biomarker test. So it's taking uh, a biopsy in the mock cycle looking at the RNA in that for the expression of a number of genes that are associated with hormone regulation. Uh, these are genes that we've done large literature search for, for large searches of the database and developed a test for the genes that most indicate the different stages of the window of implantation. Uh, and it's our custom developed platform. And you can see here, these would be the four different stages that we might report. To the left here um, is the pre-receptive, which is about 25 to 30% of patients. The receptive, where there will be no change to the implantation window. 
which is about 70% of patients, uh, the less rate frequently seen post-receptive uh, and very infrequently less than 1% non-receptive. And using this, we're trying to guide the, the optimal transfer. So for poor prognosis patients, we find the window of implantation uh, is more likely to be shifted in the repeat implantation failure patients. We use our genetic test to detect the shifting of the window of implantation. You do a mock cycle, and then you infer using exactly the same process of the mock cycle as the treatment cycle, whether to change the window. Um, there has been some uh, uh, retrospective clinical studies of window of implantation testing. Um, there are randomized control trials underway, um, but this is not an area that as yet has randomized control trial data. So I'd also like to talk a little bit about how um, PGTA, that's testing for chromosomes in embryo biopsies, can affect the incidence of miscarriage. Um, one of the things that we see quite often, probably about one in 100 cycles in the clinic, is we see um, patients that have come in that haven't had a cytogenetic screen, and we identify from the genetic test um, that they are carriers of a translocation. And we can identify that directly from the genetic test. And that's clearly an instance of poor prognosis patients with translocation carriers. Um, and they have a very high incidence of miscarriage. The definitions of um, poor prognosis are, um, are elastic, I would say. And everybody seems to have a slightly di different definition. Even um, advanced maternal age is a poor prognosis in some ways. And I was just going to present to you some data that we've just been looking at from the American uh, SART Society, which is their equivalent to uh, ESHRA. Um, and they've been collecting data from a very large number of cycles and looking at the incidence of miscarriage. This is uh, data supplied to us by David McCulloch, uh, New York University uh, and he's been analyzing this data, and it's some fantastic data, just really as much as anything on the scale of the number of cycles. So this is analysis of the SART data uh, from 2014 to 2016, um, and this is looking at either whether you've had a PGTA test or not, and in the PGTA no testing group is 112,000 cycles, uh, and in the PGTA tested group, 45,000 uh, cycles. And you can see that if you do a PGTA test, you really remove the incidence of miscarriage to a great extent with maternal age. And it's really striking data that you can, you can see the aneuploidy in this group of advanced maternal age patients, as you might expect, has a, uh, a very strong effect. But if you can find going back to normal sperm, normal egg, normal embryo, if you can find that normal embryo, and I appreciate it's much more difficult in advanced maternal age patients, if you can find that normal embryo, you can really reduce the incidence of miscarriage greatly. Um, that is one of the things that uh, is being collected in general, and a large proportion of that data came from uh, Cooper Genomics. We've also been looking at trying to actually improve our detection of euploids, and this is some data that we're just pulling together from our latest testing. Uh, and we've been doing uh, a development of the technologies to try and reduce the noise using really big data to try and improve the accuracy of our testing. And one of the things it's done, it's improved the number of euploids that we're able to report back in all age groups. And in the last six months, we've been able to report back 1,300 more euploids to our customers. And then that's led to uh, a large number of extra transfers. And that is across all age groups, as you can see in this slide. And it's impacts in two ways. First of all, because we don't smooth down the data, we just use statistical calling. Some of the things that would have been mosaic are now aneuploid. And more importantly, some of the things that are in the noise that are difficult to detect as mosaics have become euploid. So 
We hope that we're improving the accuracy of this testing and hopefully in the next year or two we'll be able to come back and give you the outcomes of this data. So the last thing that I was going to talk about in terms of genetic testing and how that might um, impact poor prognosis is male factor. And obviously, you know, male factor hasn't had a lot of embryo aneuploidy associations. Uh, and there's some interesting data just beginning to come out in this space. So this was uh, data, some of this was data that was collected by um, Katrina Vasalis group in uh, the Czech Republic. And they were looking at patients that were coming for PGTM. So these are not infertile patients, but they were looking at the origins of aneuploidies. So they were looking to see whether aneuploidies were maternal or paternal. Now, we know that the majority of aneuploidies are maternal. Up to 90% of all aneuploidies are maternal meiotic in origin. And that's why we see reduced infertility with advanced maternal age. Um, but what they were able to do for the first time was to look at um, aneuploidies that affected parts of chromosomes, segmental aneuploidies. And for the first time, they were able to see an aneuploidy that was affected and linked to paternal um, origins. And 70% of segmental aneuploidies in their uh, population were paternal in origin. And I think this is going to be a really interesting area because it fits with um, sperm uh, halo tests and those kind of sperm breakage tests. And it's something that we're just beginning to look at. I think it's, it's nice to see new areas for male infertility that we'll be able to look at in the future. One of the reasons why we're able to do that, we are just introduced a new form of our genetic testing. Um, this is PGT AI, which is artificial intelligence. We've been working on for some time in our first version. Our latest version, 2.0, is just announced here at ESHRA. Uh, and for the first time, we're able to count chromosomes really accurately using next generation sequencing, and also count SNPs across the genome really accurately for, for small changes as well. Um, and if the patients give us maternal and paternal samples, we're able to look for the origins of those aneuploidies, and we will be looking to see the paternal factors in that data. Um, and we're able to generate more data, and hopefully in the near future we'll be able to come back and present this data. So just in summary, in our PGT area, um, we can see some superb data now, huge numbers of cycles, where PGT is uh, mitigating the effect of maternal age on miscarriage rates if you can find a euploid. And I appreciate that gets harder with maternal age. Um, since we've uh, announced the first version of our PGT AI site, where we've uh, reported more euploids and more patients with a euploid have had a transfer across all age groups. Uh, we're going to go on to look for origins of aneuploidy with our new test, uh, and we're going to keep on trying to get more data and hopefully improve outcomes with more data.